So the word composer has been one that folks are kind of exploring or, or reconsidering lately. I, I wonder if the three of you can uh, speak to the implication of the word composer or the idea of being a composer. Yeah, I can throw my two cents into the pot here about that. I don't, th I've never worn the, the title well or at all really um, because my work, so I was, you know, I was a rapper. That was like easy to understand. I was, I rap, that's what I do. But, you know, rap is really like, like, I think that I hate to say it like this, but I think rap is for young people. And as I became a little bit less young, I was like, okay, I love this genre. I will always love this genre. This is like in my, in my bones, but I did want to ex expand out and find other things to do. And some of that was what people called composing, but it always felt like they were calling me that in a way that I did it. I hadn't like quite earned or deserved, not in an imposter syndrome way, but just like not, it didn't feel quite accurate to me. And um, it felt like they're, you know, I think part of the fight of people trying to recontextualize the word composer or try to understand what it is, is trying to remove it a little bit from its like uh, officialness, you know, where it's like there's certain etiquettes associated with the word. And those never fit with me either. And so um, I don't think it's a dirty word at all. Um, and when people put it under my name, when I see like Joe Horton composer, I am uh, flattered. You know, I'm like, oh man, check me out. But I think it's like with Marcos and Mary Ellen, I think they're so much more, uh, you know, versed and their body of work is so much more established or whatever. So I think of them as like composers in, in a, a term of like respect and, and myself I just see myself as like using tools that I have at my disposal like sound and uh, you know instruments and you know whatever I also write on Ableton I don't write things down so I feel like to be a composer I think you kind of have to be able to write music like to, to be worthy of the term they're shaking their heads but I'm gonna stick to that I'm sticking to it. Um, no, but anyway, I, but I think that's where the, there's some ambiguity in the term because there's so many different ways now to skin the cat that the word is kind of losing its meaning in a way. Like it's, it's becoming more diffuse anyway. Yeah, Mary Ellen, I, I wonder if you could uh, speak to your sort of disagreement with, with some of that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, sometimes I think those of us who call ourselves composers have a broader definition in our minds of that than... Um, than maybe people who kind of come from a different angle in the field. Um, I, think, I think of that word very broadly. And um, it would never occur to me that a composer is only somebody who sort of puts black marks on a page. That, that hasn't been part of my concept of composer for maybe forever, but certainly not for a very long time. You know, and I also do a lot of work across various kinds of art forms and I see the word used in a lot of different art forms. So in many segments of the dance world, there are, you know, you study dance composition. And in the perfume world, there are composers. And so to me, it really has more of the connotation of, of someone who creates. So I, I, that's how I, I think of the world. I mean, I, that, the word. I mean, I, I sort of uh, came of age in those um, areas uh, where that word had uh, had certain associations but you know a lot of what I've done over the years is try to break out of those things <laughs> so you know in my own way like stay away from the institutions and find places where I could carve out my own creative path and so to me it has it has a much broader connotation you know uh, just just personally from from where I sit yeah, and I think you make a, uh, a good point by uh, talking about the sort of then and, and now aspect um, uh, of that word. M Marcos, is it a word that you grew up with or one that you, um, you know, uh, b became acquainted with, learned to uh, use as, as far as you identify or, 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 or is it a sort of new thing or somewhere uh, between? We were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, Eurocentrism and Afrocentrism. And I think that uh, composer itself as a term has a very strong Eurocentric uh, origin, you know. So I feel that it is a title that is bestowed upon us and we as creators learn how to deal with, you know, it's, 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 it's the chain that we learn how to make just loose enough that we can feel, you know, comfortable. Mm -hmm. Owning 
Um, but I would include in the category of composition um, anyone who curates sound in a structural way. And when I say structure, I don't mean music that requires a very solid structure, but I'm talking really about the curatorship of the modality or the curatorship of the experience. It's the one that intentionally organizes a sonic event uh, and even sometimes the participation of others in that sonic event in a way that is meaningful for them. Um, and to Joe's point, I think that notation is only one of the modalities which one can engage with in order to create those events. But I, you know, I, I can think of many, many people that I that I consider amazing composers that wouldn't even touch a piece of paper, um, and 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 would still be able to control, you know, this idea of of composition in in, in very engaged ways. You know, like for example, people who engage with conduction and do the sort of instant composing. Um, there is no paper involved, or sometimes there is paper involved, uh, depending on how you do conduction. Um, but yes, it's 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 about it's about intentionality of the the sonic experience and and how much um, authorship and agency one claims within that act. Yeah, and you use that word structure, and um, between the uh, among the three of you, and among some of the next notes uh, uh, recipients, award recipients, you know, the idea of improvisation is is an aspect. Uh, Marco, so I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to that. How you know improvisation um, can be structured, uh, you know, as we talk about what is a composer and defining a composer. Oh, most, I mean, most of improvisation is structured, right? I mean, the, 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 the concept of improvising, you know, for, in order for one to engage with improvisation, one needs to engage. Uh, and if you're improvising by yourself, you're engaging with yourself. You're engaging with, with yourself temporally. You are, you are having a conversation with the things that you were about to say and the things that you just said. Um, so even when a solitary act, you know, that it's still making those connections. And when you're improvising with others, it's, it, it's about listening. I mean, and, and improvisation to me, going back to the idea of what is Eurocentric and Afrocentric, is at the very core of the Afrocentric experience. You know, it's really what, what in many ways sometimes differs um, you know, that purely Eurocentric music from, from an Afrocentric pr uh, perspective is the, is the simultaneity uh, of, you know, multiple conversations. It's the, the, the necessity of that creative connection that is instantaneous and organic in the musical discourse. Yeah engaging with yourself, you know, solitary acts. That, that's something that I think um, we've all become a little bit more engaged in in this COVID era, <laughs> of, uh, engaging with oneself. Yeah. Uh, Mary Ellen, uh, I, I'm gonna throw this your way. So a lot of the um, uh, Next Notes Award recipients uh, spoke with me about how, you know, that, that reality has made Next Notes even more impactful for them, having that community of peers interested um, in the same thing. I, I, is that something that uh, you found while uh, working with these uh, young composers? I'll use that word. Yeah, well, it's a little bit of a paradox, isn't it? Because we're together, but we're apart. So, and, you know, that's part of the time that we're in right now and um, finding ways to connect and be part of a group, but also we're each in our separate spaces. And I think that's been a really unique aspect of the Next Notes this year and the way that we've all been able to be together. Um, I think um, being, uh, being able to connect this way has worked very well. And in a, in a way it's allowed us to do some things that, we, that apparently don't usually happen in Next Notes. Like we've been meeting since May as a, as a cohort, we've been meeting over a much longer period of time. So in a way, we may have not have had more hours together, but we've had more time together because it's spread out over more weeks. Um, on the other hand, it is different when you're all in the same physical space together. Mm -hmm. There's just no getting around that. There's just, uh, there are some differences in the way you connect, the way you form relationships. Um, so I think that's been different. 
but um, I think it's, you know, human beings are, are driven to connect. And so being able to come together in this way, be part of a group, um, see one another, support one another, learn from one another is a really important part of Next Notes. And I want to say that I've learned a lot from these young composers. It's not that mentorship sort of goes one way. It's definitely a two-way street. Yeah. Uh, Joe, earlier, uh, you, you know, in addition to uh, identifying yourself um, as a composer, you said that you worked um, in, in the world of, of rap. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, what these Next Notes uh, Award recipients are doing and the world of rap or hip hop uh, might not seem exactly uh, complimentary. I, I wonder how your uh, sort of um, atypical background and approach uh, to creating music and creating art um, was a, a tool for you to engage these uh, young artists. I mean, I don't think there are any um, rappers in the in the young cohort, but but no. maybe it's a, a maybe it, it's offered you a unique way of engaging them, that experience. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I feel like uh, I've, I've become very at home with not being at home in any one spot. So I've been rapping my whole life. I think I feel that way. Whether that's true or not, that's what that's what my life is. That's what my like sense of self was built around. And so, uh, it, it, the thing is, is that it, it for a while it felt like that meant certain things that I couldn't listen to other types of music, and I felt really self conscious about that, especially being mixed. There's like this sense of like choice that sometimes people make you do. It's like which side are you on? Which side are you on? And so you know, I had a little complex about that and um had to work through that and but one of the liberating things is i found that uh you know me listening to like de la soul really in in a lot of ways in like wu-tang in a lot of ways made it uh so my ear was uh, fresher and more open to ideas and so what i found that is that in every scene you're going to have people that are uh, stifled by the scene that feel like that that they're they're sort of like culturally mandated to like certain things or to act certain ways. And I found a, a great liberation in being able to pop into one place, pop into another place and sort of um, exchange and mix up information from different scenes. And I've also found a great human undercurrent that has become my sort of shtick. Like when I talk to people about anything, whether it's rap, you can't tell me ODB wasn't a mystic. You, but you absolutely cannot. You cannot tell me John Coltrane wasn't a mystic. Um, we were talking about Arvo Pert earlier, an Estonian composer. My man Arvo is a mystic. And so that felt so beautiful to me to be like, to find a, just a, a, a beautiful symmetry between ODB and Arvo Pert is just, that's, that's all. I mean, that's amazing. That's so amazing. And I love people. I'm just like fascinated by people. And so I think, you know, what, what it, it's no, I think dipping into a lot of different musical scenes is really no different than traveling a bunch and being like a well-traveled person is that you, you're going to have your countries that you're more familiar with. Like, you know, I've been to France once, but that doesn't mean I really understand the culture, but going there informed and shaped the way that I see the world and having spent time in foreign places has, has opened up my, the way that I see things. And so really, I think that's, that's what it is. I try, to, I try to get to that ground of humanity, like the ground of what music is always for all people. And then I think the, the, it's, it's really on the composers themselves to flesh out their own idiosyncratic cultural like, things that they have to say. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't have anything to say about what they have to say. They should say, they should have to say something about that. Really, all I want to do is mix the pot up, you know? Yeah. And when you talk, you make me think of uh, how identity sort of plays a role uh, in music. And, and Marcos, I, I wonder if you could speak to that. A lot of these young artists um, engage the concept of identity more than um, I expected uh, th these young artists to. Is, is that sense of identity one that uh, uh, you saw uh, among these uh, uh, young artists? You know, we talked a little bit about that, and I think that it is a natural tendency for any young artist to think of finding one's voice, right? I mean, some people embark in this sort of quest of like, I must find my voice uh, in order to have validity. 
Um, and one thing that I that I that I tell my students and I talk to these young composers about that is that in my opinion, in my humble opinion, uh, style, which seems to be sort of like the, the, the holy grail that they want to, you know, uh, acquire or belong to, style is a consequence. It's never a cause. Um, and in many ways, uh, when one talks about one's voice, uh, one is talking in retrospect. One is talking about where one is coming from and, 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 and dealing with. Um, and, and, and that trust that your voice will come to you rather than you going towards your voice uh, is a very hard one to establish. You know, I mean, I think that people have a tendency of wanting to belong to a lineage or, or, or wanting to fit in in a specific, you know, sound world or artistic world, um, even in terms of, you know, uh, gaining a sense of acceptance, you know, like artistic acceptance or or any other kind of like herd mentality that we, we fall for as artists. And... Um, but the reality is, you know, as uh, you, you, you can and maybe you should be as free as possible, um, you know, in whatever path you choose. And, and we can, like we as human beings are conditioned to look for patterns. We are conditioned to look for consistency, you know. So even the most uh, idiosyncratic uh, journey, you know, will yield, you know, patterns. And, and, and we can draw meaning from it. So forget about meaning and just do your thing and meaning will be assigned to you regardless. <laughs> but knowing that is, you know, it's part of um, uh, aging as a composer, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's beautiful and, and it's um, like, it, it fully engages my most empathetic, you know, uh, feelings to see young composers dealing with this sort of, who am I? Where do I fit in? Where am I coming from? You know, that all of us as artists have, you know, inhabited if we don't still do. Right, right. You know, identifying style and identifying um, a pattern, uh, Mary Ellen, is something that I don't think I was able to do when I was uh, looking at uh, your very wide range of, of music and, and, and all your sort of uh, different approaches. Um, is, is this intentional? What, what, what is, you know, because some, if we look back into the past, you know, some uh, composers really excelled in opera, some were symphonists, you know, but you, you, you've broken out into just about everything. How does this um, serve you? How does this fuel you as an artist? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think that um, for me, part of, uh, well, it feeds into the conversation that we've just been having, but part of part of being an artist has been trying to uh, explore. And I, I do think that there's a there's got to be some kind of consistency because it sort of comes out of my, my work essentially comes out of one or passes through, let's say, <laughs> through passes through one human being, one human brain and heart and, you know, hands. Um, but I also think that all our experiences feed into what we do eventually. Even if you don't uh, know how at the moment you're having those experiences. Um, and that's why one of, the, one of the most important, if anybody ever asked me for advice for a young composer, the, the main thing I'll say is have experiences. Because mm -hmm. you don't know how they're going to feed into what you do or who, who you are in 10 years from now. But anything that you are really drawn towards you know, go back, to, go towards it because it somehow is going to feed into your work. So I found that for me, you know, the, the things that uh, attracted me when I was young, which certainly was, you know, music and sound, but it was also movement and dancing and it was food and aromas around the house, you know, and eventually those things fed into what I do. So incorporating movement as, a, as part of the musician's palette um, was kind of, it kind of happened uh, organically because it was something that I had experience with and now incorporating uh, aromas and scent into music is something or, or thinking about things spatially and then what is space? Is it an architectural space? Is it a, an outdoor space? Is it a stage space? You know, and, and all of the elements. And I, I guess the way I've started 
sometimes thinking ab about uh, who I am and what I do now is to say I'm a composer who's interested in all the senses. So it's not just an, an, an oral art, meaning of the ears, but um, especially when we're in the same space together, when we're physically uh, present, all of our senses are present, you know, smell and touch and seeing light and color. And, you know, we don't just go somewhere and have ears. You know, right. we, we have all of our senses. And so I think um, maybe the pieces take different forms or slightly different styles, but it's, that's the, that's what it's predicated on. But, you know, the experiences that I've, had that I've been drawn towards and the fact that I know I'm a, a complete human body with all the senses. Right. And, you know, when, when you talk about experience, I, I think about um, as I was developing uh, as a musician, uh, looking back, it was that lack of experience that, um, you know, sort of uh, kept me at that 98th or 99th percentile in, in, in college as I'm trying to grow, you know, how can you really play a phrase that sounds like heartbreak if you've never had your heart broken? You oh. know? <laughs> so, um, so, so, with, so with that in mind, I, I wonder how you are able to um, help young artists um, sort of express um, themselves uh, considering that lack of real life experience. I mean, um, many of these, uh, all of these Next Notes uh, recipients have, uh, you know, have some pretty intense experiences as, as young people, but, you know, if we're going to be honest, there are experiences that they have yet to have. Yeah, well, first of all, that's a really interesting and great question. Um, but I guess I, I would, I, I like to approach a student uh, or, or re anyone really where, where they are now. Um, that's, you can only be where you are right at this moment. Um, so that's, uh, that's all they can do. And that's all I can do when I connect with them. Um, and to know that in, in this moment, that's, that's enough. And that's a lot. And you don't have to try to be where, you know, 20 feet ahead or 20 years ahead, because first of all, that's not impossible. And secondly, it's, uh, it's much more authentic to be right where you're standing at this moment. Um, I, I guess I'll go back to what I said a minute ago, which is I think um, I encourage, um, I encourage people to have, young people to have, uh, to welcome in a lot of experiences. And, and I always think about uh, where they are, wherever you are, um, I think it's a good idea to expand where you are. So somebody might be over here Somebody might be over here, somebody might be here, but if, if wherever you are, if you can expand, you know, open your, open your thought, walk into something with curiosity rather than uh, judgment or thinking, do I like or not like that? No, just like, well, what is it? <laughs> and just to, just to walk through the world in those ways will get you very far. Joe, I wonder if you could um, speak to that, specifically, you know, the need for that sense of of curiosity. How, how, how have you, uh, of, when you work with young people, how have you um, engaged the conversation of, of uh, striking that curiosity in, in young people? You know, just ways for them to, um, as Mary Ellen uh, said, increase the tools, those tools of experiences. Yeah, I mean, for me, the, the hardest part about uh, my own life has been the search for a way to do something that ultimately was like futile and futile and futile and futile and was like, I want, I need a way and then there's no way and I need a way and there's no way. And the big breakthrough, which I think, you know, I'm actually totally stealing this from Bruce Lee without even realizing it, but his whole thing was like no way as way. But it's not, it's like Mary Allen said, right? Like the, you know, the, the you were, people are not just interested in one thing, they don't just have a, a set of ears or whatever. So it's like, if a chef is a really good chef, you better believe they will have figured out at some time that they, they need to use no way as their way. If they're a good composer, they will have figured that out. If they're a good artist, they will have figured that out. If you're a good plumber, you will have figured that out. Like the, I think that the longer you live, like if, if you are deeply engaging with life and grappling with it, you will come to understand that there's this paradox that is like the reverse principle. Like if you try to float, you'll sink. And if you try to sink, you'll float. And so I think that my sort of mission with young people is to tell them that a lot in a lot of different ways because i don't think it's something that they get a lot i think people really want to 
you know, they, they really want to like pantomime being a teacher. I mean, being a teacher is the same way as being a, being a mentor is the same way as being anything else. Like you have to use no way as your like teaching method or whatever. So I, what I trust is that if I do that and Mary Ellen does that and Marcos does that, that, and then the rest of their teachers do that, that I can play a small role in them understanding this paradoxical thing. But ultimately their real teacher will be themselves. It'll be their own experiences. It'll be, they're, they're the ones that they're gonna have to confront the, their nature of their being at some point. They are alive and it's strange to be alive. It's very weird. And they're gonna have to confront that deeply. I can't be there with them when they have to confront that. But what I can tell them is like, look, it's gonna seem like you need to know in order to go forward, but it's the opposite. You actually need to actively not know, and then it'll, it'll be like knowledge. It's like Marco said about the thing where your voice is in retrospect. That's a beautiful way of saying that, that like, if you go in and be like, I got my boy, my boy, what is my voice? What is my, I don't know, what is my voice? I don't know, like you will never find, you, you will be in the very act of trying to find your voice, preventing yourself from acquiring the traits that other people will call voice. It's paradox. I don't know why it works like that. It's infuriating sometimes. But so I just try to orient them to that. I try to orient and I try to reassure them that they're going to be fine, like that it, it's going to hurt. They're going to be anxious. They're going to struggle. But it's all going to be worth it and in ways that they could never predict. And so those, you know, th that's my general approach to, to them and really to anyone, really. What do you have to say to, um, you know, the support systems, the, the families of this, uh, these young artists as they begin to, you know, approach that frustration? How can a parent, how can a, uh, a friend, how, how can a sibling, um, you know, help these artists when, when they reach that, that, that bit of frustration that you're speaking to? I mean, lo love is, uh, there's a big debate about love right now that I don't understand. Like people are like, is love enough? And I'm like, look, in my mind, the universe is made of love, literally. I literally believe that love is like a syntax that everything is made out of. And so I think that if, you know, I would do this to my own daughter and I do it to her, I just try and love her and validate her confusion. Yes, it is confusing. Yes, it is hard. Yes, it does hurt. Yes, I am afraid. I am afraid. I don't know what is happening in life. But what I do is I, I try to develop a deep faith in this weird mystery and orient myself to that. And when I orient myself to that, things work out well. And so I think if family members can sort of validate the struggle and can love people, because an artist is gonna, an artist by definition, I think will struggle more than the average person <laughs> that should be their goal I, that's what i think anyway like i think that that's kind of what you sign up for when you sign up for the, the 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 job or whatever like you you actually engage more deeply with that mystery and that mystery is not um those aren't smooth waters like you're in a you know Pema show drone who's like a buddhist priestess or i don't know what she would call herself but she has this analogy she's like life is like you go out on the ocean in a sailboat knowing that the sailboat's going to sink at some point that's not a really rosy picture, but there's something else happening there that is very beautiful and profound. And so if you try to say to them, no, 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 it's fine. Your boat's not gonna sink. No, 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 it's, it's cool. Just don't worry about the anxiety. You, I, don't think that's, I, I don't think that's the best approach. I think it's, it's important to say like, yes, these are your circumstances. Yes, we are afraid collectively. Yes, we do struggle collectively and it is beautiful and it is lovely and it is pervaded every inch of it by love. And, you know, that, that, that works as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and, and even, you know, the way in which we can um, uh, show that love, you know, the hug is a little more dangerous mm -hmm. than, it, than it has been, you know, is the handshake uh, gone <laughs> for, you know, the, the, the way we love uh, the, the music experience in that live setting. Um, Marcos, how, um, how do you see the future when it comes to uh, that love, love of each other, but I guess more um, as it relates to what we're talking about, that love of the concert um, experience. I, I know the, uh, that, that live performance aspect is, is something that you know, drives a lot of, of your art, but that's not really um, possible right now and maybe not even for the foreseeable future. 
Well, I think that we have to, to be very generous on how we define experience, right? I mean, we've been talking about nothing here but experience, you know, like, and not only experience, but uh, the derivations, you know, thereof, you know, of experimentalism, you know, this idea that music is heuristic, that we have to embrace the 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 process, including the flaws, that you know, the the the, the path is much more important than the end, you know, that we are not producing goods, we are, you know, going through, you know, things and and and, and driving you know, conclusions of those things according to who we are at a specific, you know, time. Um, so, you know, the, the challenge now for us is to draw meaning of this, you know, and the beauty of, of, of making art is that no matter what is presented to us, our job, I guess, you know, as artists is to draw conclusions, is to draw, you know, some teachable or some some you know experiential uh meaning out of that um so for me for instance i i don't know what this means you know like uh, when people talk about like the new normal mm. I, I don't know if this is the new normal you know what i see this is this being is is the big temporary you know is the <laughs> big, <laughs> it's the big provisional you know and and and, and i don't know uh, what what this is, and I'm not even interested to tell the truth, to to really define what this is. What I think it's important for me to do is to feel this, you know, is to be in this, to 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 accept my position within this, and to experience it and see what happens out of this experience. So many artists now trying to like make. COVID-19 art, you know, like to, to, to try to bottle it up already as you are in the middle of it. And I think that one of the main characteristics of the zeitgeist, is, it's, it's that it's, it's immaterial. You know, you can't quite grasp it. So the best thing that you can do is to just be within it and let whatever that is, you know, um, enter your body and get out of it in whichever way it needs to. The big temporary. I mean, that, that has to be the name of a movie, a band. I'm going to, I wrote it down. I'm, I'm going to keep that if you don't mind, Marcos. I want it on my tombstone. Yeah. <laughs> the big temporary. <laughs> Yeah, you're hey, right. I have to, I have to grab a charger. Good. And Mary Ellen, I'll, I'll throw this your way. You know, uh, one thing, you know, we're hoping that COVID is, uh, again, that big temporary. But one thing that uh, we've seen uh, these days that I hope is lasting um, is the way we're paying more attention to racial equity, the conversation um, of race. Um, you know, I'm thinking about what uh, Nina Simone about art uh, said about art how she said that you know it's an artist's duty to reflect the times through um, what you create uh, these these conversations uh, can be difficult for um, for us grown-ups how do you um, engage that idea of being in the moment specifically this moment with um, with these young artists have you found that that's a challenge for you or maybe it isn't um, considering uh, working with young artists because you know something like you know, uh, police brutality or systemic racism may not be something that a 17 year old has spent a lot of time with, but, you know, I, I think it's, it's important to try to um, engage that side of it as well with, with, the, with the new generation. Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, there's so, there's so much going on right now. There's so much in the air. There's so much on all of our minds. And I think a lot of it is that, um, it feels like things are uh, like the ground underneath us is is a little more mobile than we want it to be you know for all the good things that that brings and then for all the difficult transitions that that brings as well um, I think actually that's true all the time hmm. that things are unsettled and unknown and um, the more that we can understand that the more that we can be on this changing you know lots in the air um, and and live it 
and live through it and be with it and not have to turn away. <laughs> um, and I think that's one thing that uh, coming together around something like music and art um, really helps us do. Uh, you know, I often think that when we're, when we're, let's say, studying composition or whatever you want to call it, we're, we're doing nothing less than everything. And sometimes we get too much in the weeds and we think that it's about notes and pitches and what we're hearing, but it's really much bigger than that. It's really about all of life. And that's, that's I, I feel that more and more, um, the more, the older I get, <laughs> frankly, and the more experiences I have. And, um, and I think I try to embody that when I'm working with younger people, this kind of moment to moment, acknowledgement that we're dealing with all of life right now, um, even if we happen to be talking about the cello or... <laughs> yeah, this is life. Welcome to life, young person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Joe, you were giving Mary Ellen a hand clap. I wonder if you could uh, jump in. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I mean, I, so here, here's one thing I found that is one of my... It, it's, it, this speaks to the whole, like, ODB was a mystic and so is our vote part. Like, it's like... The thing is, is that artists, so for Mary Ellen to say like, yeah, it feels like the ground is shifting a lot right now, but really it's always like that, is that's the perk of being an artist. There's not like a ton of perks. That's, that's the one though. That is the one where you come to understand that the ground is always shifting. And you know what? It, are things uncertain? Yeah, they are every time I open up my notebook and try to write a word on the page. I don't know what I, when I, you know, am writing where, I don't even write anymore. It's all like impro improvised now. Because I was like, if I'm gonna struggle, I'm gonna like do it orally, I guess. <laughs> but um, anyway, all that is to say is that um, we struggle to, to create all of the time. Like we confront this struggle all of the time. That's what we do. And so if the, it's sort of incumbent upon us, actually, I think, as people who engage in this struggle very deeply, to um, sort of be voices of calm when other people are like, oh my God, like things are getting really weird and the ground is shifting. And we're like, yeah, yeah, no, I've it's been there before. Like, it's okay. <laughs> it's everything. It's always doing that, but it's okay. Because frankly, there's some, you know, I have many words for this. I'll, I'll choose the word ecstatic for now, since it's the word of the day. We were talking about it earlier. But I think there is a realization of just how much the ground is shifting underneath us that is, gives us a type of existential vertigo that is very difficult to deal with. And that, I think, is what we are experiencing right now on a societal level. We are experiencing an existential vertigo, the, the very constitution of our agreements together is, is dripping and spilling away from us. And that's hard and so i think like in addition to the fact that the music that we make and the things we make can bring people together i think we also as as individuals can can be uh buoys in the storm here a little bit and i and i think that's part of our our sort of social contract with everybody else when we decide to be artists we're sort of signing up that when things get weird we're we're there to be like yeah we we know it is weird it is that weird it yeah. is that weird yeah existential vertigo that that's an, that's another one i wrote down <laughs> it sounds like they could be the backing band for the big temporary <laughs> existential vertigo <laughs> um marcos we, we've done a really phenomenal job of making um this life of being an artist sound sort of scary sound sort of um un, uncertain sound uh challenging you know uh, all words that I, I would use to certainly describe my my journey um as an artist um, how do you um, convince young folks um, to not be afraid? I mean, Joe, uh, I think Joe used the uh, analogy of, of being in the boat, knowing that it's, it's going to sink. Well, you know, how, how, how do you balance, you know, teaching young ones the reality of being an artist, the challenges, but, but, but also, you know, uh, convincing them that, you know, it, it's a path that they can take and, and a rewarding path? Well, I don't always do it. 
you know, I, I, I am not one that says, please come, you know, let's do this, because the reality is it is hard to be an artist. And I think that as an educator, it will be irresponsible of me to sell an idea that this is a very easy path, that, you know, they're going to get exactly what they want, you know, that things are going to happen exactly as planned, because I can't assure people of that. What I can tell people is that if this is something that is visceral, that is within you, that you cannot think of doing anything else, I'm here for you. I'm here to share experiences with you and I'm here to try to guide you and teach you, you know, the things that I've learned with my own journey on how to navigate through this better. But I'm not here to proselytize. I am, I am not in the business of making, you know, an artist, uh, you know, a professional artist out of everyone because not everybody should pursue a career in the art or whatever a career means. Um, but I will also say that nowadays it is scary to do anything, right? Like we are at a time right now that there is no security. You know, like if you want to be a doctor, that's risky. You know, if you want to be a teacher, that's risky. If you want to be a firefighter, that's risky. You know, and, and not, nothing is guaranteed. So in many ways, in the scale of risky professions now, you know, uh, being an artist or even being, you know, a, a non-commercial artist has gone down on the on the scale of risky just by the, you know, the, 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 the sheer fact that nothing now is for sure. You know, we are we are living at times of great instability. And I would say that um, most art comes from instability, right? Like stasis does not necessarily create art. We need ictus, we need friction, we need movement. Art is kinetic, art is somatic. Um, so the, the, the good thing is that, you know, good art may be coming, you know. Um, the less good thing perhaps is that it's scary, but if you can't look the other way, come with me and I'll show you the best way. Wow, wow, I love that. As we um as we start to wrap up here, you know, I'm thinking about how teaching, how mentoring is learning. Most most uh, I'm very comfortable with saying most of the things that I've learned are things that I've had to teach. So I, I'm wondering if um the three of you can uh speak to something um that you've learned uh, in this process with uh working these with with these young artists. I'll start with you, Mary Ellen. Oh, yeah. Boy, how do I even articulate it? I think um, certainly I learn so much every time when I come in contact with any other person, any other artist. And um, certainly I find young artists so inspiring. I come away from having conversations with them or looking at their music or seeing what excites them or um, seeing what questions they have, all those things feel like um, they, they open up my world too. Um, so I think, you know, kind of, kind of all of it helps me do what I'm always trying to do, which is be more expansive. Well, what about you, Joe? I'm glad Mary Ellen went first because that was well said. <laughs> I feel like uh, being um, in community, is extremely important to me and I'm often isolated like I'm you know spend most of the time in the studio by myself anyway or with like another person um before any of this happened but when I poke my head out and I get to hear Marcos and Mary Ellen speak about their journey and it matches mine that feels really good like that feels really good and so I'm like okay that's great and then it's like okay but we're you know similar enough there's whatever and then you you talk to a 15 year old and she's like you know i just feel like this sometimes and i'm like i do feel like that sometimes that's how i feel that i mean yeah that feels good so i don't you know in in terms of i'm gonna slightly dodge the question and instead of saying what i learned from it i'll, I'll say like what i got from it which was um the joy of being in community and sharing experiences with people and having those experiences bounce back to you in their idiosyncratic ways so it's like they're telling their own little story, but you can match it up to the larger picture. And that's, you know, that's a really rewarding experience. Yeah, Marcos? 
Um, I mean, one thing that I always learn from from young composers, uh, and it's becoming even more of the thing, is how organically eclectic this younger generation is. You know, I think of like the, my peers, I think of people of my generation, and how this idea of having very strong likes and, and sort of categorizing oneself was really important to assert yourself. And when I deal with younger composers, Composers, more and more what I see is this much broader uh, way of understanding what constitutes a concept, you know, and how different things can coexist in that constitution of the concept. And this group was no different. I mean, every single discussion that we had on talking about, you know, music, we would talk about things that were very well-defined, uh, artistically speaking, but when it came time to sort of uh, give examples to illustrate whatever concept, the, 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 the breadth of, of, you know, the variety of uh, examples that this, this, this artist would mention uh, and the, the, the acceptance, you know, towards things that, you know, sometimes were extremely contrasting was really inspiring. And um, I, I would never, um, uh, witness such an openness if I were talking to composers of my generation. And I think that that in itself points to a, um, a great, hopefully, you know, better things in our future. Uh, Mary Ellen Marcos, Joe, it's been so great to uh, talk with you. They, and, and thank you so much for uh, working with these kids. I, I know that Absolutely. I know that their experiences that, that they'll never forget working with the three of you. I truly mean it when I say my pleasure. Absolutely. Here, my pleasure. Real pleasure.